Hi, I'm Nivedita Indrajit and I'm talking to Sujata Meha and um, she is the one who introduced me to something called choice. I met you around 10 years ago and, uh, and at a workshop demo which one of my dance partners introduced me to and said, you should go and attend this workshop. I'm like, workshop? I've never attended workshops. So when I came to your workshop and we did an exercise with the thread and all and uh, boundaries and stuff and suddenly the pop came in my head that I have choice. So that is my introduction to you, choice maker. And a, a person who can facilitate choice in other people's life. So thank you for having this conversation with me. Thank you, yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure and my honor to be, to be called for a, for a conversation of this nature. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I'd like to know, like you have had, you have had 30 years or plus experience in uh, psychology, psychotherapy and you know, uh, all that, right? So how did you, I mean, did you get into it like directly or was there any other options available to you when you were a kid? Okay. So uh, I, by the way, let me correct that. I've, I have 28 years experience. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I like to add my training into it and make it 30, but no. Okay. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when we were studying in my time, um, the, the classic options were science and maths. So you either became a doctor or an engineer. And the second tire would be a lawyer or an architect or a chartered accountant. Anything okay. other than that was meant for the not so good students. Okay. And humanity especially was like for those who just can't do it. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, I was a very good student. I did buy PC. I got very good marks. But I was just not interested in doing medicine at all. So there was a lot of um, scheduling and forcing. But I said no. Um, I think by then I had recognize that people simply sit and talk to me. People who are younger, older, much older. When I used to travel, um, the passenger next to me also, anyone, men, women, they would just keep talking. And I knew that there was something I'm, I have or uh, something about me that allows that. And what was that? What is that thing was my quest. So by then, luckily, I knew there is a field called psychology. Um, and I had to fight a lot to, to get into a BA where I could happily do an MBBS and an MD. Uh, but I did it. And I have, I'm so glad and so um, grateful that I could do that, that I, I followed the path that I did. Yeah. So that's how it came up. So uh, you were abroad for a while? To study? That was, no, no, no. That was much later, much later. Okay. My studies entirely happened in Hyderabad till my master's in psychology, Osmania University. Mm -hmm. And then for my MPhil in clinical psychology, I went to Nimhans, Bangalore, which is the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences. Mm -hmm. um, there, uh, the training is similar to psychiatry. Uh, okay. But of course, clinical psychologists do not prescribe medication. Uh, okay. So it has to do more with counseling and psychotherapy. So uh, abroad was much later. That was after I had established a really solid um, clinical practice here. Huh. Uh, my husband then, he, he wanted to go abroad. So we left and we were there for about five years. And uh, did having children change the way you approached your work? Well, uh, yes and no. In the sense, no one tells you before you have children as to what it means. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're a parent for life. You're a parent until I, until I think you die. Yeah. So... The, the kind of time and emotional investment it takes to become a parent, I think no one ever tells you that. So yes, I think in the initial years, uh, it was a, a pretty much a circus kind of thing, trying to balance this and that. 
but also it has um, changed me as a person. I feel I just yeah. feel I have come more and more into myself, more grounded, uh, more living the principles that I have held as ideals. Yeah, uh, more closer to the earth, literally, and more in touch with the feminine side. So it's a gift and it's a challenge, both. Yeah, especially when they're very young. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, like when I met you, right, you were doing uh, the self-discovery program for 100 hours. I remember this very clearly. You yes. Know, art and science of self-actual, it became art and um, science of self-actualization. And I did, it was called Authentic Dialogue. Correct. And it has transformed. I think even before that, you said it's transforming itself. And then I'm sure in the last 10 years, it's transformed more. Can you tell more about the program and who can actually be part of it? I mean, who can actually sure. choose? Surely. So, um, one of my gifts that I discovered very early on, I used to uh, tutor my cousin who used to live with us, my younger brother. Okay. I realized that I, I teach very well. And uh-huh. in fact, uh, it is my unconscious competence. At 3 a.m. in the morning, Even if I'm rubbing my eyes, I know I can do a great job in teaching. And teaching is not just, you know, the standard blackboard kind of didactic teaching, not just that. I think I bring a creative uh, approach to communicating uh, uh, complicated or experiential ideas in a way that the person carries that understanding with them in their body, not just in their mind. Yeah. So, um, so because of my own love of teaching, when I started practice, there was hardly anybody in private practice as a clinical psychologist, or perhaps I was the only one in private practice at the time. We are talking 1991. Okay. Uh, the rest, the, the other people were usually attached to either a psychiatric hospital or a private practicing psychiatrist. Right. Um, so many uh, youngsters or any other people who miss the bus, I, what I mean by that is they love psychology, they have an innate interest, they are gifted, they, they are the shoulder that people lean on when they are in trouble, uh, but they don't have the formal training to become counselors. So such people used to come and ask whether I would take them on in turn or teach them or something. So that's how the course began. It began as a experiential um, workshop to teach the basic skill of listening, listening for the experience and asking questions in such a way that the person finds their own inner wisdom. Not that you need to give them advice, not that you need to direct or guide them, but but listen and question them about the issue in such a way that they find their own answers. So that's how it began. So early on, it used to be called PG Diploma in Psychological Counseling Skills. It was um, um, kind of run in collaboration with uh, a a small private body at the time. Okay. Uh, Then slowly, I came away out of it and uh, it became different names. It was called Integrated Counselor at one time. It was called Authentic Dialogue at another time. Dialogue for Transformation at another time. But I think in the last eight, nine years, it has remained steady uh, because I feel it's found its niche. And that is the, the, the whole path and purpose of self-actualization. Right. Uh, this term, self-actualization, although it is coined by Maslow, it is there in all our uh, ancient uh, traditions and our texts and our scriptures as well. The whole purpose of existence, of human existence, namely the Purusharthas, this is, this is that actually. How, how do I discover who I am? How do I engage with others and the world? And then how do I reconnect with what I'm supposed to be doing in this life? Or why am I here? It's a very fundamental question. Yes. So what I discovered is in, in helping someone else, you can actually learn a lot about yourself. So I, I never tire of saying this, you know, who I am today, 80% of that credit goes to my clients. The, the amount I learn from simply listening to the struggles that people have and in trying to do my best in helping them, showing them the mirror, the, the depth and the 
profundity of learning that comes is incredible. So I, I was like, you know, conversation and helping someone feel better. That itself can be your path to your own deep self, to self-discovery, to uh, personal growth, to self-actualization. So now over all these years, all these principles, all these ideas that I have learned, I have created uh, activities which are uh, embodied kind of, um, uh, you know, um, things that people do games or exercises or dyadic work or triadic work where they're instructed to do something to get the meaning of what is what is it like so for example when we talk about empathy yeah there is enough on google about what is empathy but i doubt if anyone really really understands the the core thing of it but in the class the way we put put people through those activities they get bits and pieces bits and pieces that stays in their memory that remains in their muscle memory so i think it's very rewarding when today uh, people who have done the course way back in 90 first batch was in 95 so way back from there even today on a regular basis i keep receiving small messages saying i i had this case today i did this today i had this fight today i had that issue today and what you said in the class that day, this day, that really came and it helped me to thank you so much. So it, it's very, very rewarding, very reassuring. Uh, so we have more than 300 alumni of the uh, course so far. Uh, we have a Facebook group called Inner Horizons Alumni. Um, and most of them are practicing. Some of them are counselors. Some of them have gone on to become coaches. They have taken on coaching uh, credentials as well. And some like you have become healers and uh, it's it's been, it's been beautiful so that's the workshop now you also asked who is it meant for so like i said uh, this workshop serves two purposes one is it can be used exclusively for your own self development you're just curious about who you are what's going on with you uh, uh, what what is stuck with you what is it that you're looking to overcome um, what are you trying to discover about yourself? It could be a self-inquiry kind of a process. It, it also teaches you the skills of doing the same for somebody else. Enabling um, the, the, the attitude of growing through whatever you go, grow through. I'm sorry, go through. The, the <laughs> tagline is grow through whatever you go through. That is the tagline. So okay. it also teaches you skills of how do you enable that for another person who is in the middle of a crisis, who's having some issue or, or not, doesn't matter. So how can you use conversation for deepening into within, into yourself, you know, that that's the thing. Okay, thank you so much for that. And I think the time that when we did that, we were also asked to do a course separately uh, in psychology or something for a one year. Yes in um, St. Francis College so that it yes. adds to the... Yes. No, no, no. Not, not necessarily St. Francis College. So what um, the course that I teach is a hands-on thing in terms of the skill aspect of counseling. But to make it uh, legal and viable and, uh, uh, you know, to, to look at it as a valid and certified kind of a course, I always have recommended that the students, those who are serious to take it up as counseling, get a master's in psychology. So that master's can be from, uh, you know, an online program, a distance education, any, any Indian university, UGC recognized university that gives you a master's in psychology. That would be a helpful add on to, to this because yes. see, everyone who does MA psychology comes and tells me, they teach you nothing. I teach you nothing about this human interaction, yeah. counseling, listening, empathy. The practical parts of it. Nothing at all. Yes. So, but, but, but it's a recognized degree. So I always say that, you know, you get the degree, you learn the skill, then you're good to go as a practitioner. But if you're, if you're not interested in practicing, this is enough. This, this will give you tools for the rest of your life to keep playing around with. As you said, something or the other keeps coming up when you, when you're in the midst of that, right? Yeah. And uh, you've uh, recently written a book and it's been published, The Beloved. Yes. How did that happen? <laughs> yes. 
Um, and I've read the epilogue. I've read these poems, and I think I love I love the poem Gratitude. Okay. Uh, uh, that is there, and uh, the words that have been said. There's a lot of information, and I feel it. It can be. If I had a physical copy of the book, I would just open it one day and read whichever will make sense for that day. I, that's the energy I get when I play with that book. Not just as a read. That, let me get, grab a copy of it. Let me grab a copy. Pardon me? No, I said, if you don't mind, let me grab a copy of it. Just to show. Okay. Yeah, one second. Yeah. Okay. The book. So yes, this is how it looks as a physical copy, paperback. Yeah, yeah. when yeah. the delivered calls, and that's the backside. Yeah. yeah. So actually, I think someone like you will realize that. But I do want to say you're right. The book actually, the constant feedback I've been getting is they use it as something like an oracle. Yeah. Um, something like um, if they when they wake up, they have something going on in their mind. And they just open it to some poem, and that's um, that's been very meaningful. Uh, that can be very directional, or that can be very reassuring, or different ways, different things are happening for people. Yes. Um, so, what was your question about the book again? Uh, I wanted to know how it evolved into writing because I know the epilogue. I mean, unless people buy the book and read the epilogue, they'll know how the book happened. But for yeah. record. For the video yeah. Uh, kind of thing, so. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, this is, I think, a, a, what do I say? A very important milestone in my journey. That's how I would look at it. So, as you know, I uh, was married. I'm no longer married. I was married for 20 long years. And um, uh, in 2014, I think, uh, we were legally separated. Uh, I was minding my own business and uh, the rest of the story is there in the epilogue. Uh, what I discovered was when you uh, believe that you have fallen in love for someone, usually we take that energy outwards and go chasing the person. But in my case, that was not possible. First of all, because this person doesn't even, uh, I mean, he, he's across the oceans in another continent altogether. And this person till date has no clue that someone has fallen for him like this in his, uh, you know. And uh, because one, there was no opportunity. Two, my children were small. I was wounded. I did not even have a, iota of energy to think of another relationship it was just impossible because I think when you get married and when you have children you give it your 100% plus another 100% plus another 100% you there's nothing left is the feeling you have so when you don't go don't turn that energy outwards and go chasing the person or the possibility there you will have to turn it inwards and go in and see what happens so I think that, that thing, uh, partly circumstantial, partly by choice, got me in touch with a part of me that I didn't know existed. A part of me that is capable of such intensity, such depth, such ecstasy, such deep longing, such fragmentation and such coming back again. It, it is just like a, like a, uh, roller coaster ride in a, in Disneyland, I would say, uh, and the the it, over the years it taught me that both parts of the ride are good, the going up and the coming down. Both have their own different yeah. quality of excitement and in, in intensity. And uh, what happened was, as I, I, I to to and this is something I felt I couldn't go and talk to anybody about or explain to anybody or do anything. So uh, I thought maybe I should write and then this poetry just kept coming. So I used to simply write and post on Facebook. Nothing at all, just like that. It would come, I would write it. Then in my contacts, there happened to be this gentleman who is an editor with uh, the, the group that published it. It's called Envision Earth Media. 
so he would religiously like and love and comment on those poems and he would say things like these are very deep um these remind me of rumi and i'm like uh, i've heard of rumi but i've not i really haven't read much of him uh, except the quotes that go around he said no 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 we should publish i i, I was like that that i even that idea was very alien to me i was just writing because that was my experience but he persisted he persisted for a good 2 3 years he said no there is depth in these poems there is value we must publish we must publish i said okay fine so that's how the book came along uh, it it's uh, i call it a unplanned baby <laughs> <laughs> literally because um the writing of the poems was far more easier than compiling them and getting you know going through them editing them and then sending them for the publishing and getting the the book and you know once you switch out of that mode into the action mode of getting things moving it's a very different energy so yeah. but then after all that it came out last year in june the kindle version came and in september the paperback came uh, this mm-hmm. one yeah and uh, this is of course only for indian readers the uh, uh, outside here yeah, you have to go to envision earth website and uh, place an order so it's printed on demand it's called pod okay so only those who ask for it will be given a print i think the the media house is committed to this green earth idea so they don't believe in printing and stocking right so, which is great yeah which is a nice so, yeah. thing actually Yes, absolutely. So that's how the book came about. <laughs> oh, this is so beautiful. I want to actually say something like Rabindranath Tagore wrote Gita Anjali the same way. Yeah. In the sense, he uh, transformed whatever he was going through, or whatever is his experience, and whatever it is, he he converted it into Gita Anjali. So when I when I see, I'm not comparing the works or. Uh, they're saying the same but that is what i see when i read the book or that is thank what you. i perceive thank you uh, so much <laughs> um i also want to say another thing big and i think this is becoming clear to me later much later see even when i wrote the poems i never used to think that i am writing it, yeah. it would just come uh whoever has been reading the book and some people have been so kind and generous to pre-read before the publishing and give their endorsements etc uniformly everyone talk has mentioned how it reminds them in some way about the bhakti poetry mm-hmm. or the meera meera has been mentioned a lot yeah 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 and um, uh, all the all the bhakti poetry basically so i think the the urge to commune with something higher than you or the urge to just be one with something someone is yes. a is a universal human need right. and i think if you really go into the depth of it without fritting fritting away that energy in this that and the other yeah i think you touch that you touch that the the taste of divine in that and uh, it it is it is a very and it is delicious experience. it is delicious <laughs> it is delicious and it can be very distressing also yeah <laughs> so as i say in the uh, blurb on the back you know both love and longing they they are two sides of the same coin you can't feel one without feeling the other and each has its own depth of richness right so they go hand in hand so uh, there has been like when you read some poems it's like it stirs something within and it's probably even unearthing something related to it as an individual yes so uh, i mean i i would highly recommend using that for an oracle for a year at least or uh, i don't know if you have a program around it or a blue book uh, facilitation around it or so here's the thing what happened was uh, it just came out in um, september last year the first book launch the first two or three book launches happened in mumbai thanks to a couple of very very good and dear friends uh, then um, uh, december there was a book launch in hyderabad jan it was meant to be in delhi from there it went downhill thanks to the weather and then to covid right so by book launch what i meant is not the typical thing that most book launches do this is this is 
by invitation, small groups of people who come, read, listen, ask, and it's a very intimate kind of conversation. So there, I have been asked the same thing that you're asking. Like, do you plan to do a book club reading or a personal growth process using the book? I think I would like to do that. I would definitely like to do that. Uh, hopefully, sometime soon I will start. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. You, you can hear me? Okay. So, uh, the, the, one of the very touching uh, feedback I got from about this book was a, a very dear friend. Um, she said the, uh, she was doing some kind of a sadhana with uh, Shivji. Uh, Shiva. Mm -hmm. She said, I decided after seeing this book that I'm going to do it for 64 days because there are 64 poems. And every morning, I will offer one poem at his feet. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so different people are doing different things with it. Some of them have started reading it out to their own personal beloveds. Which is, you know, the, their, their spouses or the people they are in relationship with. Uh, some of them read it out to the divine. Some of them believe that it is the divine's message to them for that day. Because as you said, they open the book in the morning and check. So it seems to be doing its own thing. Uh, but yes, I would like to, I would like to do a, a book process around it, you know, with a, with a close group of people. Yes, that's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And also, uh, you have been working with a lot of couples and, you know, uh, I think in the journey... Mm -hmm. What I mean, I know that there is no how-to or there is no uh, blueprint to understand how relationships can work. Mm -hmm. But what are the consistent areas that you uh, come across when people are in conflict with each other? Okay, so this is <laughs> huge. As a, as a therapist, this is my favorite question. Yeah, because uh, I think once you have. These the two models to explain this one, which, which I've evolved over the years of working. They're not from any book. Uh, I think once you fit here, things can be quite simple, right? So I would not uh, list out the areas of conflict like this. This this makes people fight. It's never like that. There are broad. Um, uh, what do I say? baskets, components, whatever you want to say. There are four different things which, which are at the bottom of every conflict. So no matter okay. which conflict you take, it will fall into one of these four baskets. Right? Okay. So one is physicality. That is physical compatibility. This includes, but it's not restricted to only sexual intimacy. It is the, the comfort of physically being near somebody. Right. So sharing the same room, sitting on the same sofa, eating from the same plate, if needed, uh, hugging, touching, hitting, pinching, rolling over, falling over, uh, being close, uh, holding hands, kissing, all of these, not just sex. Right. So if this this thing is uh, healthy and going well for a couple, uh, that ensures that there's no, not too much conflict happening. If there is conflict, this could be one of the reasons. Okay. Right? Yeah. Second one would be finances, financial security. By that, what I mean is, of course, as you understand, it's a very personal thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people can be secure with 10 lakh rupees in the bank. Some want 500 crores. That's a personal matter. But the sense of we are okay, both of us are okay financially, we are not going to go on the streets. That stability is very, very important for a long-term intimate relationship, whether it is cohabitation or marriage, doesn't matter. Yeah? So okay. that's the thing. Now, mm -hmm. if they're having trouble in some area, somewhere they're fighting, it can be because of this area, this pillar as well. Yeah. Okay. The third thing is uh, shared values. This is a big one. Mm -hmm. By this, what yeah. I mean is, see, one, one of the tragedies that has happened in the modern era especially in the last 30 years for India and perhaps 50, 60 years abroad, is that people believe that romance has to do with two people finding each other, somehow finding the special one and meeting. And that's mm -hmm. it. Then life is just delightful. Actually, what happens is when you meet like this, after a point, you start going this way. Yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't, 
it doesn't yeah. sustain it is motion what and action sustain? yes what sustains is once you find that person you both need to turn towards something that is commonly um, your pursuit that is a shared dream a shared vision a shared shared value a shared purpose something it has to be something beyond the two of you right for most people it is the children and their welfare which is fine but which is quite limiting because mm -hmm. uh, who you are as individuals tends to get subsumed to who you are as parents so mm -hmm. until the children need you that becomes is a common purpose but even before that or definitely after that i think it's important for the couple to introspect and understand and communicate what is it that they would like to put their energy to because you can't keep yeah. looking at each other all all your yeah. life it's not possible you have True. to look at something else together yeah. together yeah? yeah so the direction has to be in in the same same direction right so that is to do with shared values one of my favorite example is you know which school should we put the kid to so if you are from hyderabad the fight can be between an oak ridge and a vidyaranya mm -hmm. so they are not fighting about the school nor are they fighting about the fees nor are they fighting about the commute they are actually fighting about something very deep which is a value system which is to do yeah. with uh, one parent wanting the child to be prepared for this competitive cutthroat world you know and go to all the achievement based things that are required the other the other parent values the the more softer uh, uh, sensual things beauty art craft human connection uh, singing music you know those kinds of things so that's the that's the dilemma that's the value system clash yeah, yeah. right that's the third third basket the fourth basket would be uh, um social identity this is especially more applicable now by that what i mean is uh individually both the partners can have their own identity so okay. this one must be so and so and so and so and she is something else and something else they they can have their own uh, exquisite um, networks and careers and identity and earning and all that is there but do these people together show up as a couple are they invited as a couple do they go as a couple do they enjoy hanging out as a couple do they have activities together as a couple either in their uh, official professional networks and also in their uh, social and community networks family okay. networks extended okay. Networks. Okay. because i think the ecosystem is a ma massive um, what do you say holding space or a container for marriages to to sustain to 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 exist actually mm -hmm. marriages which do not have a solid ecosystem tend to unravel faster when there is conflict when there is trouble so these are the four areas that you have to look at when something is going on so they can they can come with any problem they can say she she talks too much to my uh, sister and she is not spending time with me or oh he is he is the mother's son and he doesn't talk to me anything any presenting complaint will come down to these four things so then we look at and uh, understand what is the deal for each of them and then how do we find uh, a common ground how do we then come together on that clarity on that understanding yeah so this okay. is the thing yeah i hope that answers your question yeah so my question is also like generally off late especially there is people talking about my space yes so yes. yeah my space my personal space yes. uh, yes. personal interests and pursuits so when you're talking about these two people meeting mm -hmm. and looking at something of a shared value does that also include the personal space of whatever they want to look on their own or how does that come into equation over oh here? absolutely absolutely see i think uh, this is one of the great uh, misconceptions we have that if a person exists as an individual it is dangerous to the relationship or a good relationship requires that you sacrifice yourself as an individual you okay. couldn't be farther from the truth a strong relationship is possible only when both these things are strong your sense of autonomy has to be strong and your sense of attachment has to be strong yeah so in fact in my classes i use a ppt where you plot uh, autonomy on the bottom mm -hmm. and you plot attachment on the y axis mm -hmm. so you have low autonomy low attachment you have a very loose apathetic kind of a relationship 
Okay. You have high attachment but low autonomy. Mm-hmm. You have very entangled relationships. They're just caught up between themselves. They're right. good times, bad times, fighting, making up. They're, they're just there. Yeah. Then you have high autonomy but poor attachment. Then these are relationships where one or both partners are kind of indifferent, kind of apathetic. They're just pulling along. Something is mm-hmm. going on. That kind of a thing. Whereas the last quadrant where you are high on autonomy and very high on attachment, those are the couples where there is true intimacy because they know themselves very well. They are able to respect and honor the space of the other person as well. Mm -hmm. And so a clear communication and negotiation of what each one wants and how much each one can give to the other is possible. Right. So personal space is not contrary to relationship clarity about personal space clarity about personal boundary and the ability to communicate that without making the other person wrong right goes a long way in having a vibrant relationship see because as two different people you can also grow each other right. you don't have to be blended like a siamese twin it's not not necessary not recommended at all actually yeah in fact, two large trees cannot grow in each other's shadow. Right? Uh, yes. That's what Kalil yes. Gibran says. Yes. About Absolutely. marriage. Yes. And he's right. Yeah. Absolutely right. <laughs> yes. Yes. So um, there is also this whole conversation that happens in psychology classes and stuff like that about dysfunctional family systems mm-hmm. and how one needs to break away from that and create a system that is functional. Or, uh, you know, it's like a very scientific way of putting things. How do you actually uh, are able to enable children to see that while we are actually going through this process of transformation? Yeah. So let me start off by saying that uh, except in a psychology textbook, I have not met a single functional family. (laughs) So so the idea of this so-called functional family is a composite theory i don't yeah. think such a thing exists anywhere worldwide yeah. this is but not it's just... so significant in exactly this. yes so i'm coming to that right so the the whole concept of oh that is dysfunctional this is so you have to break away you have to do... i don't think you you have you can break away i don't think you can break away from anything that you're brought up in your yeah. parents and their parenting methodology is in your dna <laughs> you don't break away what you do is you make it conscious by looking at it and then by using your rational uh, ability to bring about change gradually because you're also unlearning a habit of so many years in trying to do that. So I would look at it this way. A dysfunction is anything that is causing you to lose your personal power. Okay. Yeah. That that is the meaning of at, at the bottom line, like, I was talking about the baskets in the previous model. In this one, that's the bottom line. When you say something is dysfunctional, what you're actually saying is, in this system, and marriage is a system, family is a system, community is a system, the country is a system, everything, the world is a system. In these systems, like natural systems, have their own principles to work well. And one of the principles is, the, the basic principle is about equilibrium. No matter what is going on in the system, it will keep trying to bring it back to equilibrium. And sometimes in unnatural systems, human system being one of them, the equilibrium is often brought at the cost of something else. In natural systems, that will never happen. In human systems, it happens partly because we have choice. So one person will justify himself by saying, for the larger good, I will sacrifice myself which is great if it was only possible and true. But along with the sacrifice, just underneath the great positivity of sacrifice rides the negativity of resentment. So that also comes in the system, right? So it may look like it's functioning, but there is dysfunction. Why? If we go back to the definition of dysfunction, it is because it is costing somebody their personal power. Right. Now, why is personal power so important? It has to do with integrity. And by integrity, I'm not talking about a moral or a religious or an ethical idea. That just complicates the matter. Integrity is a very basic, fundamental, functional 
workability idea it has to work like for example there is this clock if some parts of it are taken out so that it can fit into a small uh, square in the cupboard it has lost its integrity correct in order to fit into that slot it has taken out and broken some parts and now it is sitting there it is it's no longer integrated such a beautiful example <laughs> <laughs> so so now what how much of a watch is it how reliable yeah. is a watch is it yeah. is it going to last is it really yeah. going to tell the time correctly is it going to mess up so now you have the ripple effects of loss of integrity yeah. right so that is what we mean by loss of personal power so personal power has to do with integrity and yes it is it is not this simple in complex situations like marriage family society i understand that but i think at least if you know this you are more likely to choose in a way that you retain your integrity so that you retain your personal power so that you are true to yourself so that you can be at least true to somebody if you're not true to yourself you cannot be true to anybody else it's as right. simple as that right so uh, so coming to your question uh, dysfunctionality shows up in the clinical space as unhappiness anxiety depression resentment frustration all of those symptomatology what is that ultimately bottom line it tell, it comes down to one or both partners acting out of integrity and often this is because we are afraid we are afraid of hurting the person we are afraid of losing our space uh we are afraid of losing privileges we are afraid of losing approval we are afraid of losing an image that we have constructed of ourselves so it's all a process of unraveling your fears examining them and realizing that they are more mental constructs than reality issues yeah and then once you have that clarity confidence comes automatically and mm -hmm. then people can then do what works for them okay you know? yeah so thank you so much for this conversation it's like little brilliant light bulbs bulbs going in all places it's like wow it's so simple and you make it so complex uh, i know well it took me a long time to make it simple dear <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you no one, no one teaches you this in any school i think you learn it only in the university of life yeah. i wonder what what can happen to make this like a palpable thing much younger when we are much younger so that we can actually have access to it no i think uh, with more and more people being willing to examine this i think we are heading in that direction slowly but steadily yes yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else that I missed out on asking you? Um, anything that you would have wanted to talk about? Not really. Since we did speak about family relationships, dysfunction, and conflict, and all that, I would like to end with my other model, which uh, I believe is at the is like another. Uh, what do you say? good to go for all situations kind of thing so maybe i can just very quickly talk about that um this is to do with uh, how, how do you we spoke about identifying breach of integrity right now how do you maintain integrity this is about that that's the mm -hmm. model right mm -hmm. so this has five pillars it's called the five pillar model of intimacy i want to define intimacy as the the state where you bring 100% presence attention and regard to this moment in front of you no more no less nothing else that's intimacy so right now you and i are talking you are 100% focused on me i am 100% focused on you the phones are off there's no disturbance there's nothing at all this is an intimate conversation yes that's it that's all there is mm -hmm. in this depending on our relationship our uh, history our plans our hopes our aspirations our dreams whatever it is we develop slowly the depth to go into how vulnerable i want to be with you and vice versa right and that will take us deeper and deeper and deeper into intimacy that is what it is 
so there are component there are pillars or there are aspects in the way two people relate which either enables intimacy or disables intimacy right so the first pillar is exclusivity which i already explained which is yeah. you and i are right now exclusive only to each other we are not distributing our attention in multiple things or multiple yeah. people so yes. for a relationship to be truly strong and uh, do what it is supposed to do exclusivity is mandatory not from an ethical or a moral perspective from a workable perspective mm -hmm. so this whole idea of um, open door and uh, checking out and trying this and living that and doing this it, it doesn't work ultimately it only feeds therapists like me <laughs> we'll have a good practice the more <laughs> we'll do this kind of thing right so exclusivity is the first pillar second pillar is respect by respect uh, yeah you're there um, you hear me yes yes yeah okay by respect what i'm the implicit understanding that just as i with all my flaws and all my virtues have a right to exist on this planet Someone else with their virtues and their flaws, even though I can't understand this, it is that basic thing of I am here, they are here, and we are all here. No, no judgment, no making something right or wrong, no trying to uh, superimpose something or take out something. Yeah, that's basic respect. This is to do with the yoga principle of ahimsa. This is what is ahimsa. It is okay. about allowing space to something, allowing space to something because it exists. It is there. It is there already. You you yeah. can't do anything about it. You in fact have to let it be, allowing it to exist. So that is basic respect. So if you regard somebody from that space, the space of deep regard and allowing, already the person will feel respected. So that's the second pillar. Next pillar is care. Care has to do with understanding or if not understanding listening to what the other person is asking from you what do they need from you and trying to meet it to the extent now in this there's a yet uh, you're not expected to be mind readers or psychics where you can read what they want this is about the other person taking responsibility to tell you what they are needing it's an explicit expression of what their expectation is and trying to meet it in authenticity in integrity not by you know sacrificing yourself or doing something extraordinary just what is possible and if it's not possible to authentically say that it is not possible so that's about care that's the third pillar the fourth pillar is trust trust again it's not about some romantic idea it's not about infidelity and all those are extreme situations trust is about the congruence between speech and behavior so for example if i have said to you i'm going to meet you at 7 then i show up at 7 and if i'm getting delayed i inform you that i'm getting delayed it's about staying connected to whatever you have promised or delivering whatever you have said so behavior and speech congruence is to do with trust and the last uh, pillar is to do with commitment. Commitment, people have come to think of it as saying yes to a long-term relationship or marriage versus not. This is not about that. That is more to do with exclusivity. Commitment, no matter what we are going to face together, since we are in this, we will do it together. As in, we will play the game from the same side of the net, not as adversaries on the opposite side of the net. Yeah. So whatever is happening, let's look at it together. I'm not going to walk out on the problem. I'm not going to walk out on you. That is what is commitment. So exclusivity, respect, care, trust, commitment. These five will enable you to maintain integrity for yourself and for the relationship and hopefully not fall into dysfunction. And what happens is as you do this, and we do this with mostly uh, people that we are not in too much intimacy with in terms yeah. of closeness of relationships, right? 
notice how harmoniously those relationships and we get into trouble in intimate relationships that is again to do with what comes up from our yeah it it has to do with what comes up from our childhood which is a whole other topic maybe we'll do another conversation on that yeah. which is to do with uh, all the childhood wounding that we go through and uh, in in the way we are brought up this is not to blame parents this is to uh, to address what happens in the name of parenting worldwide not just here i think parents do what they do for the best results unfortunately cause a lot of damage um yeah. so the wounding and how children then adapt to it and how those children get married more than the adults who are getting married and how they keep fighting that's a whole other process it's it's to do with trauma work within yeah. relationships yeah? yeah but i think broadly if people can follow these five pillars hopefully the relationship should should do better yeah thank you so much for being in conversation with me thank you nevedita this was a pleasure thank you so much i'm so glad that uh, we had this opportunity for such a relaxed and intimate conversation as i would say yeah and um, i wish you all the best i wish you all success at whatever you're doing thank you and uh, let's stay in touch and uh, hopefully soon as we are allowed to get out and have a cup of coffee let's do that yeah we yeah? do yeah all right take Bye. care bye bye